you know, I've done some, some versions where I'm just strictly observing and starting to get a feel for what works and what doesn't. And then coming in here, I get to be a little more experimental. I'm celebrating World Watercolor Month with a new video every day in July. Okay, so this is last week. This was a fire tower out uh, on the edge of the mountains, close to Tumbler Ridge, which is a beautiful little mountain village. Uh, I was, I knew the fire tower was out there. I was pretty sure I could get to it with my truck and I wanted to, you know, enjoy the shelter because often in the, in, up in the mountains, it's windy. Um, so I wanted to enjoy the shelter of being out uh, and being able to see such a great view from a high vantage point and be able to paint it. So my sister came along with me. She actually did her first watercolor painting ever. Um, so this is uh, driving, just leaving the, after we left the fire tower, we were taking photos through the truck windows. And uh, you can see here, these are the, um, some people call them tamaracks, some people call them larches, and they turn yellow and then lose all their leaves in the winter. And this is gonna be our reference photo for today. So in the description below the video, you should be able to download it after we're done here. Uh, we'll be looking at this in a little bit. So often the photos we're drawn to it have some strong contrast. They have just a strength in the composition that is compelling to us. And um, I'm just gonna convert it to black and white. Oh, see, that's a similar one. It's slightly, the creek is just slightly over to the, to the right. And you can see when I convert it to black and white, uh, you can really see the, the dark values uh, along the edge of the creek. And you can see them uh, along the background as well. In fact, there's a really nice dark contrast uh, where the creek gets shallow at the, kind of in the middle of the page and then the trees come up kind of dark from there and then they meet up with the horizon. So I really like the pattern of contrast here. Um, I started working that in my um, value study, which is just a single layer. Uh, everything's wet and wet flowing together. And you can see that it just um, really gives you just that beginning of understanding the scene. So I'm just gonna work up a sky color. Uh, I like starting from top to bottom when possible. It's just a little bit easier. And I wanna keep the sky simple. It's very easy to think that we need to, um, and I'll list the colors I use there in just a second. It's very easy to think that we need to add a lot of um, all the values that we see in our sky. And I just find that a simple sky feels so light and effortless. And that's what I want. So this is a Cenarius blue combined with, I think, Verdider blue this time. And I just, uh, Cenarius blue is a little bit turquoise, uh, which I like. Um, Verdider blue tends to be not turquoise enough to be a good sky color. Um, for a summer sky or fall, you know, this, this particular hue is kind of somewhere in between turquoise and, and that kind of mid blue. And so by mixing um, a cobalt or a, or a Verdider blue, I start to get um, just something that's somewhere in between and I like the feel of that. And then I think I'm gonna add just a little bit of, there's a little kind of pinky violet here in my palette. I'm gonna add a little bit of that and that's gonna give me a kind of a, a violety gray. So I'm just gonna drop in a little hint that there might be clouds. in a few spots. You know, this painting isn't really about the sky. And that's the other thing to remember is, you know, we're just painting, uh, we're painting the autumn and autumn's all about the colors and the landscape. So we really just want our sky to um, be that underpainting uh, for, for what's yet to come. And then the next thing I want to touch is my, my water. And I want to do that while I can still, um, while I still have some of this blue here. In fact, I had to top it up a little bit. Um, we've, we can see some of the sky reflected in our water. And um, I'm just going to pull in some of that color and flow it down. And one thing I want to notice, um, and going with the black and white version, um, converting my reference photo to black and white is helpful for this, is notice that the water doesn't all stay the same color. Um, there are areas where the reflection makes it look almost white, and there are areas where the color is duller and a little more muddy. And I want to 
not paint um, rigidly um, all of that, but just recognize that there is some variation there. And actually there's a really pretty flow that's happening. Uh, the paper I'm using today is Hanamula. Um, it's their cold pressed. I think it's their, oh, it's their thicker 300 pound cold press. And um, there's some really lovely texture that's happening in, in the water as well. Just I'm just moving back to study the photo again and not, um, not it's not big on my screen. I should mention that. It's just a little postage stamp size. And um, that's helping me to see how everything fits together. So we want that cooler green to be our background color where the distant trees are kind of dark. And um, I like using zoocyte for evergreen trees. So we're gonna start with that. And yeah, let's just pull a line right, yeah, right across. I think we can get away with that. And right in here, we've got trees that come down this direction. So we're just going to make that connection happen right now. Use the side of my brush and just feather that edge a little bit. I'll feather it up a bit too. Brushes, uh, we buy a round brush and then we spend all our time using the point, but it really is nice to be able to have um, the side of the brush <laughs> for uh, some of this as well. It, fills the area faster, it creates a more irregular edge, and um, you can see how pretty that is. And then I want to also suggest um, some distant trees. We've got a little bit of bleeding happening here. Uh, I've, there's some distant hills, rather, and I'm going to use um, the zoocyte, but I'm going to um, adjust it a bit as well. Uh, those distant hills are covered with the same evergreens that we're just painting here with our zoocyte. And um, so I want them to feel connected, but they're also further away, so they might have a little bit more of this atmospheric hue of coolness to them. So I think the moon glow will help me with that. And I'm not losing any sleep over that bleeding of color. I have tilted my board just a little bit. And that helps, but if I start to, well, I'll show you in just a sec here. Um, if I start to feel like my color from my landscape is creeping too far up into my sky, and, I, and I'm hesitant here because really we want unity and flow. We don't want this to feel like um, something where we've pasted in a bunch of um, each different section of the painting. So I'm hesitant to, to um, react. I slow down and think about it. But if I were to feel like I maybe have just a little too much color coming up into the sky, the qualities of water can really help make some adjustments. And using my original blue color, I can bring in some fresh color and that fresh water will push back against that encroaching color. So it changes my sky because I'm bringing in, I'm darkening the value, you know, I'm bringing in some, uh, adjusting the contrasts there as well, but it does um, just create kind of a, a victor in the power struggle between does this color push up or does that color push down? So the newer color generally is the one that does uh, the, the most movement. <laughs> and so now you can see I've got sky creeping down into my landscape. And then I get to decide if I like that or not. So every decision, um, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. We learned that in school. And, um, you know, we see that here. Uh, okay, so I want to start playing with the beautiful autumn colors. I'm going to pull out my Aussie red gold and drop it into this little pink area of my palette. I'll just pull over so you can see that. Um, the palette's actually stained, I think, with the pink. So it's not as pink as it looks. But um, I was working with Schmincke Red Violet and it's got just a very staining pink hue to it. So let's let's not start, I, I started, did you notice I started with some little small brushwork and I don't wanna do that. Let's actually create a big passage of this beautiful warm color. And we wanna remember that there's white um, contrast in here. There's um, our light on the, light on the water that looks white so we don't want to lose that 
So our orange comes, doesn't come right up to the blue we've already painted. We're just gonna let that flow. And um, while, it's, while it's still moist, we're gonna do the same thing on this side. And then I'm gonna start playing with touching in some beautiful color. And if all I get from this is a unified first layer, I'm going to be very happy with that. Because if I can create a first layer that has uh, this beautiful flow between the different elements, that's such a, a superpower for future versions of this painting. And, um, you know, we tend to judge our paintings based on the finished outcome. But if I have a beautiful foundation created, I can paint that. Um, in variations again and again and again. This is a little pure raw Aussie red gold. And, um, and every time, you know, I have this knowledge that that first layer indicated to me where everything got kind of pulled together. So, um, yeah, so that's the priority here is just figuring out how do all of these elements move together to create that foundation. From there, I get to... Um, yeah, play and explore um, over and over again. Anytime I paint the autumn, it's going to be um, more of the same. So that's the Aussie red gold, that underpainting. It's quite moist. And so then now we get to um, bring in some additional color. I'm going to switch brushes. Up until now, I've been using this sable brush from Rosemary and Company. It's just a number 12 round. And um, so it's just a, just a nice round brush. And I think I'm going to move into just studying my brushes and trying to decide. Um, I'm trying to decide between this one and, um, and this one just, uh, and I think I'm going to go with this one. I want to bring in some texture into the bushes here. And so um, using a scruffy little brush will be really helpful that way. And uh, I'm just going to grab some raw sienna. And we're gonna throw a little bit of that up in here. And it's gonna be subtle. I'm not very good at subtle, but I'm doing it anyhow. I'm just bringing that lovely yellow up across right here. And if I, as I look at my reference photo, that's kind of what I'm, I'm looking for, little paths. Um, in the painting. So there's kind of a path of evergreen trees that zigzag from the horizon down to the creek. So we want to look for that path. There's um, the path of the creek itself and then the path of the uh, elements that are along the edge of the creek and they're kind of a contrasting darker value. Oops, that's... This is a hard brush to control, which is both good and bad. This is um, a little bit of quinacridone sienna, or I think so. Yep, quin sienna. And you can see it's a very brilliant, transparent orangey red. I'm not sure I should be placing it down at the bottom of the page. Let's just place it. And let's place a little bit up here to kind of create that movement across the page. And then I can decide if I want to maybe wet it and rinse some of that away or if I want, if I like it. And I'm actually starting to like it, so we'll leave it. Um, and then I want to put in some violet because I just, I know what I like and I like violet. So I'm going to use Shemika Manganese Violet. And, um, and anything I've ever taught you about using um, consistent colors, like choosing a a small range of colors, um, you're probably thinking she's just picking a different color every time. And uh, I am, but there's a little bit of method to my madness as well. Um, because I know what I like to t um, and I know what works together because I've used those colors so many times. So um, yeah. And the manganese violet creates such a lovely pop of contrast. Oh, I like that. That was a little bit more intense than I thought I wanted. But um, look at how, what does it do? It brings you up. So brings you up to this part of the painting. And then we can maybe, I'm just going to try to blend it a little bit. 
Um, rather than, like I took this unexpected kind of decision and rather than trying to erase it, um, we work with it. I'm gonna see what I can do to accommodate it and have a little fun with it in my scene. So it just I just softened it a little bit there and it, it's a great little shadow color against that green. And that makes me wonder if I should put some of it over here. And the, the green here is actually quite dry, but the yellow is, is still pretty moist. Just give you an idea of what to expect as I place those colors. And actually, I think I'm gonna go straight violet down here and just kind of soften that yellow. Um, yellow and a violet will, of course, kind of neutralize each other. <laughs> They'll um, start to create I'm being much braver with this than I usually am, actually. You know, often when I'm teaching um, or demonstrating on camera, it's so easy to just stick with what does the photo say and just go directly there. But I'm really um, having some fun bringing in these unexpected colors. And I think what the, I can give the credit for that to the plein air excursion, you know, being outdoors and experimenting with this means I already have, you know, I've done some some versions where I'm just strictly observing and starting to get a feel for what works and what doesn't. And then coming in here, I get to be a little more experimental. So I've been adding color along this edge of the creek and that's given us lots of really brilliant um, color and contrast with our creek, which is mostly white. But I want to also um, give that creek a little pop. It's uh, going to look flat unless I think about some of the reflections. And so I can see some, some of the richer blue of the sky in the background. So I'm going to just use this unpredictable scary brush to kind of place a little bit of that blue. And then maybe let's, let's use a spray bottle and soften it a bit. And I'm really just trying to, I'm, I'm really just kind of figuring this out as I go. <laughs> just lifted a little excess moisture so it wouldn't uh, bleed too much into the water. There's a little bit of violet on my brush right now. I'm just going to use this pointy brush to drop a little bit of color in at the edge of the creek. What I'm really seeing in my reference photo, there's a few things that uh, I, I think one question artists often ask is, is what, what's the most important stuff to focus on? We know that we can edit. We know that we can simplify, but what part? <laughs> How do you know what part to emphasize and what part to simplify? And for, so it's really helpful to spend time with your reference photo thinking about, you know, what, what is important here? What matters? And um, as you think about you know that strong contrast at the creek is important uh, the and really the passage of your eye coming down um, why did I stop at the creek and not anywhere else because of the contrast uh, you know driving along if it was just uh, I I think there was you know there were lots of places where I could have stopped and just taken pictures of the road stretching off into the distance but it was the reflection of the creek it was that beautiful um, contrast between the the fluid water and the spiky bushes um, all of those things can really impact your your impression of a scene and so those are the things i want to think about and focus on so i'm pausing <laughs> and i know uh, when i've got the video camera going it's so tempting to just want to be non-stop movement into the painting um, moving that brush but i need to pull back and think, okay, what, you know, where's the painting at? What am I seeing? What does it need? And uh, one way I do that is by looking at it through the viewfinder of my camera, I'm doing that right now. Um, there's a beautiful softness right in here. And this kind of fades away into kind of uh, an indistinct shape as well. Looking here as well, we have an intersection of water with landscape. And so we want people to anchor there. And so that is really what I want to focus on right now is bringing people into the painting. 
Uh, I love the softness of the texture down here. I like these little marks here. They help bring the eye up into the scene and then these kind of counter up against it. And I think I want to, I, I have my evergreen trees, just that basic shape suggested. So let's actually um, paint some evergreen trees so that we have more than just that basic shape. Let's um, pull some trees up so we have some form here that suggests those spiky, um, wonderful contrasting trees. You know, the evergreens don't change color unless you're, unless you're a tamarack. And so we get instead uh, the, the, the they're, they're kind of, there's a sameness there, but it gives us that ability to see the contrast um, with the amazing fall colors. So using the spiky brush took away some of my control so that I wasn't trying to, with precision, paint every detail of that tree. Um, from there, I can tidy it up a little bit if I want with a round brush. Um, maybe make the inside of that shape a little bit thicker. And I could drop in an additional color. Um, I'm going to see what the manganese violet will just do in the, in the center as a shadow color. And that connects this tree to this little area here too. Um, oh my goodness. Okay, let's just get in close. I want you to see this. Right there, that little area makes me really happy. Look at how that um, reddish orange just glows against that violet. It's it's just um, it's like the color just started to sing as I added that little bit of extra manganese violet there, and um, I don't you know I I shouldn't touch that <laughs> if I want to be happy with it. Uh, I be I better not touch it some more. That also brings this evergreen tree kind of as a focal shape. Um, there are a number of evergreen trees, kind of taller ones along this side, and there's one that comes actually up quite a bit further. I'm not sure if I should make this taller or not, so I'm going to hold off on doing that and just um, continue to create some more distant spiky evergreen trees. Just flicking with this scruffy brush. And as I move towards this tree, uh, I know that if I'm using the same zoocyte that I used here, I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose this tree. So that means I need to change my color as I get closer uh, if I don't want those two uh, elements to fade into each other. And I'm thinking if I'm gonna change it, what do I change it to? This is quite a cool, strong, cool shape. So if I warm up my um, distant trees, that should work better. And we can do that. I'm debating which color I should pull in. Let's try pulling in the quinacridone sienna, which we already used down here. Um, if I'm changing the color temperature of a color, I'd rather change it by using a color that I've already got in my painting. So I've just added a bit of the quin sienna here. And I'm gonna also make this um, distant tree shape a little bit narrow and small. So I'm not gonna, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna change it. Uh, I'm not gonna do a big thick stripe of this warmer um, quinciana uh, zoocyte combination. I'm just uh, making it quite narrow so this tree continues to kind of pop out. We'll just pull a little bit of that uh, same brownish green over on that side as well. That kind of works. Um, I like that, I'm happy with it. And let's use a little bit of that neutrally brownish green just in a few spots down below here too just to create a little more um, shadow and separation between some of the areas of the painting. A little bit of neutral. And having a strong contrast right at the back of the creek where it reaches the land, that's going to really pull the eye into the painting as well. And um, I'm going to actually grab straight up quinciana here. Um, it's and just put a little bit right in here. Uh, I think that's going to be a really nice contrast with the blue. Um, I'm here. I'm drawing from what I know about color contrast, right? Um, I know that blue and orange are complementary colors, so um, if I want 
to have something that really pops against the blue, I can choose one of its complements. But I also, um, I'm also not always sure. This is just an experiment and it might not work as effectively as I was, as I hope. And, um, you know, every, every choice is going to impact not just the stuff it goes beside, but other elements in the painting. And if I create a strong contrast here, uh, I might lose contrast in another area. Or I might have to, if I have a really strong contrast somewhere else, I might really have to put a lot of contrast there if I want this to be the instant kind of drama area. So I have to be aware of that kind of ongoing tension between the things that have contrast and the areas that are, you know, softer and quieter and how every brush stroke is going to affect the painting uh, as a whole. So I'm just looking at my reference photo one more time you know there's a lot of actual texture in the creek that i'm not painting i'm really kind of simplifying and i've made this about one objective going into the scene coming up to here i could um, spend more time adding detail um, along around the water there's actually rocks there uh, that are casting shadows and making ripples we could um, choose actually um, a little bit of a uh, neutral here. I've got a kind of greenish, greenish gray here um, that is actually the same uh, tree color that could cast some shadows and create some ripples here. And that could give my water further dimension. And, um, and I have to decide if I want that. Do I want to spend a lot of time adding detail to the water? Um, it will uh, sometimes adding detail in one area means now suddenly all the other areas feel a little bare and naked. So then you have to start adding detail elsewhere. And so it starts it, this whole chain reaction. And uh, I'm not sure how much I want to do that. Um, let's just throw just a, a little bit of shadow here. It definitely moves the eye right up into the scene. The other thing I have is in uh, along the edge of the water, I have a lot of little bushes that are kind of spiking out over the water. And I have to decide if I want to paint those in. Um, there's a reflections here from the um, lands, from the, from the twigs and things. So do I want to um, paint those? And if so, do they need to be as crisp as they are in my reference photo or do I, they need to be softer? And uh, let's just try pulling out a little bit of suggested shadow here using the same man uh, manganese violet that I used um, in here and um, but wanting my reflections to be a little softer and ind more indistinct than they appear in my reference photo uh, so that they don't take over and dominate the painting. Those crisp edges you know they will take over so we want to be careful where we place them just because our photo says that this is a crisp area doesn't mean it's going to work in the context of the painting. Final question is do I pull my tree up to make it a little taller and I think the answer to that is yes. So let's do it. Um, and it's going to be a bit of a scruffy little guy because we're in the north and the trees do tend to have to fight with the long winters. Um, they don't always thrive and grow lush the way they might down further south. It is super fun to take a painting uh, like this and just stab at it with one of these scruffy brushes. Um, so that was really, really enjoyable. And then in my plein air painting the other day to take um, a, a sword brush and create these much more clean and crisp shapes and have it also work. Um, you know, those, those uh, little experiments um, in what can Angela get away with, they make me really happy. And uh, I try to look for that in my paintings. And I just thought of something else I want to do that will be fun. And that is, um, let's, uh, I want to I do a little bit of spatter with the manganese. So let's see if we can get away with that. And uh, yeah, that's, I think that's working. Whenever I do a bit of spatter, um, I often will spend a little bit of time just adjusting with my brush. Um, softening a bit in some spots, sometimes connecting some of those spatter shapes so that they don't um, look too out of control. 
I think that works. It feels a little later in the day because of the way that moon glow crept up into the sky a bit. There's a little bit of murkiness back there. It just has this very, it's like a heavy feeling of calm, if that makes sense. Um, at least that's what I'm seeing here. Thanks for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with more watercolor advice you can learn from. Don't forget to include the hashtag World Watercolor Month when you participate and post watercolor art in July.